Right, and welcome to those of you joining us on YouTube now as well. We want to thank Bedrock Earthscapes for sponsoring this webinar. Sponsors like Bedrock Earthscapes help us to keep these webinars free for everybody. If you work for a business or uh, know somebody who would be interested in sponsoring our webinars, please drop me an email. Um, you can also help to keep these webinars for free. At the end of the webinar, you're going to be taken to a page with a whole bunch of resources of things you might be interested in, like our native plant guide, rain barrel information, all kinds of other great stuff. But you'll also see our virtual tip jar there. So if you're enjoying these webinars, I do encourage you to donate to help keep TCF uh, running and help us do all the awesome stuff that we do because we do so much more than just webinars. So you can also check the box to become a member and then you can enjoy our wide variety of members only stuff. So for example, at our uh, plant sale last week um, or two weeks ago, I guess now, um, our members got in a day early. So they got to order stuff before everybody else. All right, as I mentioned, we do these webinars every week and we have been for over a year now. It's really crazy. So um, upcoming webinars, We've got on May 19th, we're gonna be talking about conservation of Illinois dragonflies. That's gonna be a really cool one. Um, I'm looking forward to that one. And then on May 26th, we'll be joined by our friends at Green Gorilla, not, not gorilla like they, but gorilla like the fighting style, I guess. Um, but Green Gorilla is going to be joining us to talk about earth eco-friendly land management techniques. So I'm excited to hear what they have to share with us as well. Oh, and Mary mentioned the National Wildlife Foundation has a plant finder. So that's another resource that you can look up to. So, uh, and it also says what insects are supported. So that's very cool as well. All right, without further ado, let's go ahead and start the show. There we go. And that is my contact information on there too. So if you have any questions, the uh, emails that come about this webinar um, come from my email, so feel free to respond to those. Um, that's also my desk line there, which I'm mostly working from home at this point, but I do get emails with all of my voicemails. So if you want to leave me a message, you can do that too. So as I mentioned, I am with the Conservation Foundation, and this is our mission here. Um, we improve the health of our communities by preserving natural areas and open space. And you know, everybody's like, okay, great. Let's pres preserve open space. Let's protect water, yay. But at the, at the heart of it, it's really because it improves our health as humans, as well as the health of our ecosystems as well. So it's just basically good for everybody when we do that. And we are an accredited land trust. As I mentioned, there are land trusts all over the country. And this accrediting body it, that's out there um, checks over everything. It was a huge process. So we're very proud of that fact. And you can see on this map here, this is Northeastern Illinois. You can see all of the land that we've helped to preserve over 35,000 acres, 200 parcels, 43 conservation easements across seven counties. So we are a very local organization. We are not national other than our webinars, but we do a whole lot to help protect land in and around the Chicago area. So now let's talk about shade. Since all of you have at least some shade in your yard, you're probably aware that shade poses some challenges. Uh, grass does not grow very well in shady areas. Um, frequently those areas can be muddy, which makes it even more of a challenge to get grass to grow there. Um, and you know, I, I hear all the time like, oh, this area is so shady. I just can't get anything to grow there. Nothing will grow there. Well, I am here to tell you that's not true because nature abhors a vacuum and there's always something that will grow everywhere. So think about the woods. When you go into the woods, when you walk around the woods, you never just see a bare patch of ground unless it's like a trail that gets constantly trampled and compacted all the time. Something will grow everywhere. So the trick is finding those things that will grow in those places. So there's a great variety of native plants that grow in different uh, wetness conditions, and we're going to talk about some of those today. But again, the, that idea that, oh, it's too shady, nothing will grow there, 
not always true. So some things to take into consideration, is it full shade or only part shade? Does it get sun maybe, you know, half of the day or a few hours of afternoon or morning sun? Or maybe it's just totally shady, full of trees, big tall trees, no, you know, nothing but maybe a little dappled sunlight gets down to the ground. All things we need to take into consideration because some plants can handle that deep dark shade and some really are more what we call edge species. They're things that grow up along the edges of woodland. So they got to have a couple hours of sun every day at least. Another thing to think about is, is it wet? Is it dry? Or is it mesic? Mesic is a term that you'll see a lot of times with plants and it's sort of that that Goldilocks situation, right? Not too wet, not too dry, it's kind of right in the middle there. So a lot of times you'll see something that'll say it can handle wet or wet music conditions. So in other words, it can handle areas that are wet most of the time or periodically wet, but you know, just sort of damp a lot. And then also, what are the trees that are around there? Because sometimes trees can have an impact on the plants that are willing to grow in those areas. So things like walnuts, black walnuts can put out chemicals through their roots um, that will inhibit the growth of other plants around it. Um, pines and other evergreens can also be a challenge because they, the needles make the soil very acidic and that can also impact what plants can grow there as well. So all things that you have to take into consideration when you have a shady area and are trying to pick the right plants to go there. So these are just a couple of sample designs that I put in there. One of the things that you may notice across both of these pictures is they both have a path that goes through the area. Paths, I think, especially if you have a larger area with native plants on it, a path is a really important thing to have in there because not only does it make it easier for you to get in and, and really immerse yourself and, and really fully enjoy what you've got going on there, it also makes it easier to get in to do some weeding. Right, as we know, native plants take less time to manage, but they're not zero time. So you do have to keep an eye out for weeds and things like that. And having a path makes it easier for you to access all areas of your landscaping so that you can get in there to, to remove those weeds or do whatever kind of maintenance you need to do. Something else you might notice um, that path on the right also functions as a border. I find that when you have native plants in your yard, having a defined border can make it look much more neat and intentional. So for those of us who live in you know, urban and suburban areas, we, you gotta deal with your neighbors, right? You, you want to have your native plants and you want it to look nice and, and be natural. But at the same time, we also have to take our neighbors into consideration who may not share those same thoughts and values and you know we all want to stay on good terms with our neighbors. So one way to keep that area looking a little bit neater, especially if it's in a front yard, is just to have a really well-defined border there. It also makes it easier for you when you're trying to weed to know where the plants should stop. So um, that's, that's my recommendation for design. I am not a landscape designer, nor do I claim to be, but it's just a few things I've picked up with the, you know, probably hundreds of yards that I've gone um, to talk to people about their landscaping. So um, those are my tips. All right, so we mentioned native plants. Why do we use native plants? Well, as we mentioned, they do save you time and money because native plants, whatever happens to be native in your area, they're intended to be there. They're adapted to the conditions that you have here in the Midwest. We have hot, dry summers. We have cool, wet springs. We have springs like this one where it got really warm for a week and then all of a sudden the temperature dropped again and we've since had frost. And we, I think we had frost last night too. So they're used to that though. They're okay. They can handle all of that. And part of the reason is because of the long, deep roots that they have, which we'll look at in just a minute. Um, but again, they are adapted for our conditions. So when we have our native plants, like this little garden that we have here, looks like it's great for pollinators with some of those nice pollinator loving plants there. When we have these plants, that brings in the pollinators, the insects, the butterflies, the butterflies, 
they're host plants. So they lay their eggs there and then we have the caterpillars. And when we have the caterpillars, now we're helping out the birds, right? Birds need caterpillars to feed their babies. In the late spring, they stop coming to the feeders quite so much because they're on the hunt for these insects and things to feed their babies. If you've ever watched a mother bird feed the babies, it's really violent, right? They're cramming those insects down the baby's throats. And if you've got something like say a cricket or a grasshopper, there's lots of pointy ends on those. They could really cause some damage. But caterpillars are nice, they're soft bodied, they're like little sausages, right? Um, and I've seen studies that show they actually have more protein than an equivalent piece of beef. So it's, it, in addition to that, then they also have all these um, important nutrients and things that help the baby birds develop the coloration that they're gonna need as an adult then to attract a mate and so on and so forth. So these are really, really important for our um, babies to have. So when you bring in the caterpillars, then you bring in the birds. And then of course, when you bring in the birds, you also bring in these guys too. It's kind of the way it goes. And you know, I know we don't all like to see it, but what this means is we've created a balanced ecosystem in our yard. And that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to provide food for everyone so that our yards become a part of the ecosystem instead of apart from the ecosystem. All right, and I mentioned that we've got these plants that have very long roots. And this is what we're talking about here. So on the left, you can see all of those uh, exotic species that come from, you know, mostly Europe and Asia, um, Kentucky bluegrass, again, I've seen that it's native to Europe. I've also heard it's native to the Mideast though. And um, that's why it's got that very short net-like root system is for holding on to sandy soils. That's not the kind of soil that we have here. And so what we have to do is we spend all this time babying these plants, trying to convince them that they are wherever home happens to be for them. And with our native plants, we don't have to do that because this is home. This is where they're from. They know what they're doing here, those long roots. After those top two to three inches of soil dry out in the summer, they're still finding plenty of moisture deep down further in the soil. Some of our native plants, their roots can go down like 14 or 15 feet. It's crazy, but that's how they manage to take care of themselves. So when you see things like prairie burns, right? It just takes off that top part of the plant but they, because they have this robust root system underground, they're able to bounce back really quickly. Whereas the exotic invasive species can't do that. So that's why fire is a management technique, usually in larger, not so much for home use, but you'll see it in forest preserves or any kind of um, you know, prairie restoration. Um, fire is very, very important to helping to keep those weeds out. All right, let's talk about some plants that we love here. So first off, wild ginger. And I put wild ginger first because it is my absolute favorite shade loving plant. I recommend this plant all the time for everybody. It's a nice low growing ground cover type of plant. It's got that really bizarre flower you can see there on the right. Um, and these big heart shaped leaves that persist throughout the summer. It really likes it shady though. So, you know, it, it's, it's not terribly picky. It can handle a little bit of sun, but it really doesn't like to get too hot or too sunny. So if you've got a, a shady area of your yard, you're looking for some kind of ground cover for it, this is really it. It can handle a wide range of soil moistness. It blooms really early in the spring, but you're it, like, it's blooming right now, um, at least here in my yard. And it's, it's the flowers, you really have to go looking for them. You know, you have to like lift up the leaves because the flowers bloom underneath the leaf. Um, but very, very pretty. Um, if it dries out too much, they may wilt a little bit, but as soon as we get any bit of rain, they'll perk right back up again. So um, they spread quickly, but contained. So I've got a patch in my yard. I planted maybe, I don't know, two or three little plants and they've fully taken up this area and other things will grow up in between them, um, but it really is a lovely plant. Fun fact, 
It is completely unrelated. It's not even in the same family to the ginger that we eat or that we cook with. Um, that's an Asian species. But the root smells and tastes exactly like it. It's a very intense ginger flavor. I've tried a little bit of it before. Uh, it, the flavor is actually so intense it'll make your tongue tingle a little bit. Um, but warning, don't just go eating random plants, right? Number one rule, make sure you know 100% if you're going to forage what something is and that you have permission to do it. That's just my little warning there. Um, but wild ginger, wonderful, wonderful little plant. All right, next. Wild geranium, geranium maculata. This is a great, great native plant too. It gets a little bushy, so it, it's another one that's that will take up a little bit of space, grows anywhere from one to three feet. It's got to be pretty happy to get up to three feet. Normally it stays a little bit smaller than that, but um, it can also handle a wide range of soil moistness. So if you've got a little bit drier site or a little bit wetter site, that's fine. It'll be happy. Um, another one that blooms early in the spring. So a lot of these plants we're going to talk about are what we call spring ephemerals. And what that means is these plants take advantage of the trees that lose their leaves in the winter. And before they have fully leafed out again, these little guys pop up in the understory. They bloom, they go through their whole cycle. Some of them die back, some of them will persist. But by the time the trees have fully leafed out again, they're done and they're gonna go kind of dormant until next spring. So they, they take advantage of that really narrow window that we have here in the spring in our hardwood forests when all the leaves are down and they can get a little bit of sunlight. And so they just kind of go nuts in the spring and then the trees come back and they're like, okay, we're done now. So I kind of like it because they, they tend to occur at that point in the spring when you know winter is just ending and you're really sick of it and you really need to see some flowers, these guys deliver for you. All right, Joe Pieweed. This is one that blooms in the summer and it is a total butterfly magnet. Butterflies, pollinators, they absolutely adore this plant. Now, you gotta be careful where you put it because it does get pretty tall. Um, four to six feet tall. In fact, mine in my rain garden gets about mm, probably five and a half to six feet tall. So definitely on the bigger side. So make sure you put it in an area that can handle it. Um, it likes partial shade, but it also likes wetter soils too. So if you have sort of an edge area that gets a little bit wet, perfect. Um, that's going to be something that, that Joe Pieweed is going to love. Um, and as I said, pollinators go nuts for it. I've seen everything feeding on this. Uh, butterflies, I had a hummingbird moth at it, all the native bees. I mean, everybody loves Joe Pieweed. Virginia bluebells. This one is a really special one, especially if you can get it to grow in your yard, you are very lucky. I have one that comes back year after year. It's not really spreading too much, so it can't be too terribly happy, but it, it's hanging in there. Um, this likes the mesic soils. Remember that means that sort of medium, not too wet, not too dry, um, and likes partial shade to full shade. Grows really low. Generally, I mean, you almost never see them more than a foot, foot and a half tall. Um, and the flowers there, they have those little clusters of almost bell-like flowers there. They don't have a ton of scent to them, but if you find one that's newly blooming, you sort of gather those flowers up in your hands and just stick your face in it. I'm not kidding you, they smell like Fruit Loops. Everybody thinks I'm nuts when I say that. They smell like Fruit Loops, trust me on that. If you ever get a chance to smell Virginia bluebells, you will see what I'm talking about. But absolutely gorgeous. There is a There are a couple of forest preserves near me that uh, have just carpets of these in there. Messenger Woods in Homer Glen is fantastic for these. A the couple of areas that are just full of Virginia bluebells. And just to see a whole field of these things blooming, uh, it's unbelievable. I love it. All right, Solomon Seal. So Solomon Seal is, there's a couple of plants that are sort of in this family here. Um, really likes part shade to full shade. Um, so smooth Solomon seal is a very common one. The way to tell the difference is the position of the flowers. So true Solomon seal or smooth Solomon seal has flowers that grow out of the nodes where the leaves are. 
and sort of hang underneath where the leaves are. False Solomon seal, on the other hand, blooms from the top. So you've got all your leaves going up, making this sort of stair step, and then right at the very top is where your flowers are. So Starry False Solomon seal, also very similar. Um, and again, the flowers are just a little more star-shaped, I guess, than the False Solomon seal. Um, but you can see they grow two to four feet, one to two feet. They, again, like shade to part shade. This is one of those plants, too, that I have found as we clear invasive things out of an area like honeysuckle and buckthorn, even without planting it, it'll just show up. So I'm not sure if it's the birds bringing it in or it's coming from seeds persisting in the soil. I don't know, but they, they have a tendency to show up. So um, always like to see these. They're, they're very distinctive. It's hard to mistake them for anything else because they have that very distinctive leaf on them. So that is our Solomon seal. And it got its name, by the way, apparently a cross section of the leaf looks like the seal of Solomon from the Bible. Um, I don't know what that actually looks like, so I can't confirm or deny that, but that's where it got its name from. All right, May apples. I love May apples. They are so sweet looking. Uh, when I was doing lots of environmental ed with kids out in the woods, uh, we always referred to these as fairy umbrellas because that's what they look like. Um, Maples are interesting in they're a biennial plant, so they grow for two years. And the first year, they just put up that one umbrella. So that one little stalk with that great big leaf on top of it, that's a first year plant. When it comes up in the second year, it gets that little fork in the middle of the stem and now it has two leaves and that's when it flowers and produces that fruit. So that's how you can tell if the plant is one year old or two years old based on whether it has one leaf or two. The fruits that are on there are supposedly edible if you get them at the right time, when they're ripe, if you get them too early, they're mildly toxic or something. Anyway, I don't get into that too much because I am not as fully versed on it and I would hate to give anybody bad ideas and make anybody sick. So, um, but that's why they're called mayapples. The fruit that comes off of there is a little round. It looks like a little apple on there afterwards. And the animals love it. Apparently it's hard to catch them before the squirrels and chipmunks and everybody else gets at them. Um, but they again, like those mesic, those middle soils, partial shade to full shade. I see these growing all the time, you know, middle of the woods. So they like it pretty dark, but they can also handle it moderately on the edge. Ferns are a great plant to use in home landscaping when you have shady areas. You can usually find some kind of fern to fit whatever moisture content you have. And when they're happy, they reproduce readily and so will really fill in an area. They look great up against a home. Um, so depending you know, on what kind of soils you have there, any of these ferns are really great choices. I always like how kind of prehistoric they look to. Ferns are, are an old, um, you know, uh, prehistoric kind of plant that have, have persisted and they're just cool. Ferns are very cool. So they can handle morning sun to shade for the ostrich fern, um, partial shade to full shade, and then dry to mesic soils for the marginal wood fern. And again, music to wet soils for the lady fern. So no matter how wet your soils are, there is a fern there you can use. Sedges are another great choice, especially when you have areas that are kind of like lawn-like that you're trying to fill in. They look very similar to grasses. Um, you know, you remember the rhyme, sedges have edges. Um, that's how you can tell. And there are many different types, again, depending on how wet or dry your soils are, there is a sedge that will fit in that shady area. So I've talked to a lot of people who have areas that, that are prone to erosion and are very heavily shaded and, oh my gosh, what can I put there? I got to do something. Sedges are your answer. So um, many of them grow in sort of clumping, but they also sort of like do that fountaining thing where they sort of fall over so they don't get super tall because that weak stem just sort of lays down. 
um, and they're they're great for covering areas. So uh, lots of different sedges. I only put three up here. There are probably hundreds. So there is a sedge that can meet your needs for whatever shady area you've got. And don't forget the shrubs too, right? If you think about when you are out in the woods, what do we see growing in the understory a lot? Well, we've got lots of shorter trees and shrubs. Red buds, which everybody loves, me too, because they are wonderful. Um, that great, great spring color that they've got. They like it shady. I tried putting one in before I knew what I was doing. I put one in the middle of my yard, it got full sun and it just died. It was not happy at all. So um, for shady areas, red buds are perfect. Um, pagoda dogwood is another one. It's got great color in it, um, easy to grow. Witch hazel, I like witch hazel. Witch hazel is one of those weird plants. Those of you who've watched my webinars for a while know I, I gravitate toward the weird plants. Witch hazel blooms, depending on the type that you get, either like early winter or late winter. Like it's, it blooms at times when it seems like it shouldn't, which made me wonder what was pollinating it at that time. And I, I ended up looking it up at one point in time. And I think it's, I think there are moths that are still out when it's, um, you know, when it's starting to get cold or just barely starting to warm up. So that's what pollinates it apparently. But great winter color out of witch hazel as well as flowers at times when literally nothing else is blooming. Um, spice bush is another nice one. Uh, birds like the berries, but it's also the host plant for a spice bush swallowtail. So that is a type of butterfly that uses spice bush as its host plant. So it's another way to bring butterflies to your yard by having these kinds of things in your yard as well. An American cranberry bush, that's a type of viburnum, another really nice shrub. Um, that gets great fall color and is, is really nice for a suburban yard. So we have our conservation at home program through the Conservation Foundation. If you are in Kane, Kendall, DuPage and Will County, you can give us a call, drop me an email, I'll get you to the right person. If you are outside of our area, there are other organizations that do kind of similar programs. There's, um, you know, pollination stations, there's, um, Cer certified Monarch Way Stations, National Wildlife Federation does one. We have a few franchisees for our programs as well um, throughout other areas of Illinois. Um, if you're interested, let me know and I can, I can direct you to the right place. But for our conservation at home program, our goal in this is to get people planting native plants, doing something with their storm water, all that sort of thing. So um, that's why we do encourage you to, to plant natives in your yard. And those are the things that we look for when we do our conservation at home visits. If you are interested in getting more involved with the Conservation Foundation, the best thing you can do obviously is become a member. And then you'll find out all the great things that we do um, as an organization. Uh, you can also visit our McDonald Farm in Naperville or our Dixon Merced Farm in Montgomery. Um, our McDonald farm is a working farm, um, probably the last 60 acre farm left in Naperville, I would guess. And uh, 49 of the 60 acres that we have are farmed organically and operated as a CSA or um, a shareholder program. So you pay for your shares early in the year and then all spring and summer, you can come pick up some of the produce that's, that we grow there. Uh, Dixon Merce Farm is a historic farm and they do lots of events there in non-COVID times. I'm sure they're gearing up to do, um, you know, get back to that. I know they're, we have a nice core group of volunteers there who um, put on really great events there. Uh, you can also follow us on social media. That's where you'll find out uh, what other webinars we have coming up and how you can get all the information about our webinars as well as everything else that we do. And you can also get your yard certified if you are within our territory or one of our franchisee territories. Just let us know and we would be happy to talk with you about certification. All right, and so once again, there is my contact information along with another lovely little shade garden there. Uh, I see we've got a couple of questions, so I'm going to pull those up now. Um, let's see, when is the best time to purchase and plant these natives? 
and can they be planted throughout the growing season? So Alexandra, yeah, um, spring is, a, is definitely a good time. I think um, sometimes it depends on the plant itself. Um, like with shrubs, sometimes fall is a better time to plant some shrubs. Um, there are some natives who, if you're going to plant seed, that their seed has to go through uh, like freeze and thaw cycles. So if you're going to plant seed, a lot of times you want to even plant that directly into the snow. So it, it, what I'm saying is it all depends. Um, unfortunately, I can't give you like one hard and fast rule about when to plant things. If you're planting plugs, spring is a good time to do it. But with some of the spring ephemerals, sometimes you can get them into the ground and the roots will get established, but you're not actually going to get any growth until next spring. Um, so it just, it, it all depends on what it is that, that you're trying to plant. Um, Benjamin asked, do may apples spread via rhizomes? I believe they do. Generally, they're, they're fairly colony producing. So when you see them, it'll be like a whole colony of them. So I believe they do spread via rhizomes, um, and which is why they tend to fill in areas pretty well. I, I like those plants a lot. They're really cool. Uh, Layla asks, any of these native plants toxic to pets? Um, once again, it's all going to depend. I'm sure there are some that are. Um, I am not, I'm not really up on my toxicity on all of them. Um, you know, a lot of times when things are pretty toxic, animals kind of know to stay away from them. But if you are concerned, that's a good question to ask your vet. Um, and there's, you know, there are other places you can go to, to research those as well. I know it, it's not native, but Lily of the Valley is one that grows in shade and we see a lot. Highly invasive, do not plant, it's terrible. It's highly toxic to pets. So um, another reason not to plant it. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, speaking of Lily of the Valley, um, someone says, I have Lily of the Valley that infiltrated my front yard and are popping up all over the place. I dug lots of them up last year, but they're back. How do I get rid of them? I'm at my wits end and hate to use Roundup, but I'm tired of digging. So unfortunately, Lily of the Valley is one of those things that is really, really difficult to get rid of. Um, and as, as much as we try to avoid using chemicals and, and herbicides on things, sometimes you just don't have a choice if you're, you know, if you're trying to get rid of these things. And that's when a small appropriate use of chemicals do that small amount of bad for the greater amount of good that you're going to end up doing with them. So yeah, because you can dig and dig until you're blue in the face and you just won't end up getting them all. So that is one I do recommend um, using again, appropriately used, don't just go, you know, spraying everything willy nilly, but appropriately used chemicals are going to be about the only way you're going to get rid of that. Uh, let's see. Is Lily the Valley the star of Bethlehem? Common names are tough. I'm not super familiar. I feel like they're not, but I would have to look it up because I'm not super familiar with star of Bethlehem. It, it, I feel like they're different, two different plants though. Um, Lois wants to know, are any of these plants growable in containers on a partly shaded urban patio? You can try. Part of the issue with trying to do natives in containers is because they have such long roots, you often can't get a container big enough that they're gonna be happy. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate, but I just, there, some, you can try, you know, the worst that happens is they don't survive or they don't survive into the next year. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it, it's unfortunate, but again, because they've got such long roots, that's what they're trying to do. And they can really be, um, you know, the container can just really stunt the roots too much for them. So you can always try. Uh, is vinca another one of those plants you can't kill without herbicides? Oh gosh, yeah. Y you know, I have talked to so many homeowners who have vinca and they say, you know, I've dug and dug and dug and dug and dug and I can't get rid of it. And yeah, at the end of the day, that's about all you can do um, or you're just going to be digging forever. Um, 
yeah, it, it is unfortunate, but yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, and we said, uh, speaking of Lily of the Valley, I tried Roundup last week and the plant looks happy as ever. Do I need to apply it more than once? I feel terrible using it. Yeah, I, I, I look at it this way. So it is a tool in the toolbox. Just like I would never try to build a house with nothing but a hammer, digging is sometimes not sufficient to get rid of this stuff. Um, I would have to look it up please feel free to send me an email and I will do some research and get back to you on it. There are several different chemicals that are available and some are more um, toxic to certain plants than others. There are some plants that you can spray Roundup on and it'll just laugh and continue to grow. But if you use something like uh, triclopyr on it, that will take care of it. So I, it's, it's one of those things I, I would have to look up what exactly the recommended um, what exactly the recommended chemical for it would be. So, um, and, and honestly, don't apologize for it. There are some times when you just have to use it. You know, we, we don't only use it. We don't use it excessively. We don't use it, um, you know, outside of the recommendations for it. When used as recommended, it's fine. So, you know, that's it. It's just one of the tools in our toolbox. Um, let's see, another question. I have mostly shade space populated by May apples, ground ivy, and creeping Charlie. What's a good site prep process prior to planting new natives? Can the May apples be saved? Um, yes. The, you know, one of the things, again, you can try and pull. Um, if you are, you can try to smother the things um, like after, after the May apples die back, might be a good time to try solarizing the area. Um, maybe avoid where the May apples are at if you can and use either black plastic or cardboard, put that down, put mulch on top. We've done another webinar recently on um, beds at the farm that we are expanding and adding more plants to. Um, check out that webinar on how they prepped that site and um, they solarized it. So they used black plastic in some areas, I think, and tarps and, and things to try and kill off the grass in the areas they're going to be planting. So um, sometimes that will help. Sometimes, you know, just pulling the, the creeping Charlie and the ground ivy. Honestly, creeping Charlie doesn't bother me too much. It, it it's, doesn't really do much harm. Yeah, it comes in and yeah, it gets everywhere. But in the grand scheme of things, it's not the worst thing that you could have there. Um, you know, and I know people will disagree with me on dandelions too, but dandelions, again, not the worst thing you can have. Um, you know, things like vinca, that's pretty terrible and you want to get rid of it. Lily of the Valley, you want to get rid of it. Burning bush, you want to get rid of it, right? All of those kinds of things. But Creeping Charlie doesn't really cause much damage. So um, I've got it in my yard and I don't really care too much. So it's, you know, it's, it's a thing. So best of luck with that. And if, if you're really concerned about the May apples, you can try to dig them up. I would attempt it after they're done flowering um, and, you know, or maybe even early in the spring before they come up, you can try digging them up and, and transplanting them, even if it's just to like a temporary location to bring them back. You know, maybe that's an option too. Uh, let's see, I have ostrich fern in the back of my yard. My husband loves them. I don't. They spread so much. How do I control the spread? Is there a fern that won't spread willy nilly? You know, it's interesting. That's the first time I've I've heard of ostrich farm ostrich fern going so nuts in an area. Um, one of the best ways to control things from spreading is actually to plant other things. So if there's more things that you could fill into the area, that may help to control it. It's a great native, that said, you know, but I am very much of the Marie Kondo attitude in your yard that if it does not spark joy, get rid of it. If, you know, obviously if your husband loves it and you don't, you know, obviously you got to come up with a compromise there. But, you know, if you have grandma's 150 year old rose bush that you love even though it's not native that's 
that's okay. Leave it. It brings you joy. Leave it. I have lilacs in my yard because I love them. I don't care that they're not native. They smell wonderful and they're happy where they are in my yard. So I leave them. Um, and you know, if you have something else that's native and you hate, get rid of it, right? Put something else there. There's always other choices to put there. So I guess my advice in this would be try to put some other things in there, take up space, nature abhors a vacuum. So you wanna put something there or nature will put something there for you. Um, but like I said, as far as other ferns that don't spread so much, I'm not, I'm not super familiar with how spready ferns can get because I, I just, I haven't heard of them going really that off the wall. So uh, let's see, what else we got here? Um, let's see. Oh yeah, Sandra says, Star of, Star of Bethlehem is a bulb in the lily family and it's different from lily. Okay, I thought so. I wasn't totally certain. Um, Chris asked about 30% vinegar. You're welcome to try it. Um, it. It's, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I, and sometimes with those homemade um, herbicides like vinegar and Dawn and all of that, it's, it, it's not necessarily more friendly to the environment. Um, salt especially is really terrible for your soil. Um, and Dawn dish soap is actually really terrible for the soil. It kills a lot of the fungi and things that we require in the soil to help keep plants healthy. So um, if you think about it, like going back to Roman times, what would they do after they destroyed a city? They would salt the land. They would literally pour salt all over everything because it kills everything. So um, I, I really, and, and it persists in the soil is, is the even worse part about it. So um, that's why we talk about, you know, in the winter, one of the big things we talk about is managing how much road salt gets put down because of all that salt ending up in our uh, waterways and things. So um, it's, it's tough, you know, it's, it, it's tough. Um, Chris asked about violets. Well, so depending on the violets that you have, I mean, violets are native. They are a butterfly host plant. So I've got violets all over my yard and I kind of leave them be because I think they're kind of pretty. Um, but again, if they're not sparking joy, get rid of them. Um, that's a, another one. Um, I haven't done much work to get rid of violets. So I would have to look up what the recommendation is to get rid of them other than just digging them up. Um, Doralyn says, eat the violets. You can eat the violets too. I've, I've made candied violets before. It's kind of fun. Um, Paul wants to know recommendations of Northern Illinois nurseries that specialize in native plants. So Possibility Place is the closest one to me. It's one that we do recommend. Uh, Midwest Ground Covers is another one. I believe they are out of St. Charles. Um, there's a few others too. Feel free to pop it into the comments um, if you know of others in the area. Um, there was one called Painter's Palette that was in Naperville. I think they may be out of business though. Um, send me an email if you wanna know more. I've got a whole list of places that we recommend. Um, there's a new place in Mokina that's doing trees and shrubs called Native Roots Nursery. Um, they're just getting started. Most of their trees and shrubs are kind of whips at the moment, but you know, it seems to be good stock. So I have, I have hope for them. Um, Chris wants to know what works around pine trees. Ginger. Um, my pine trees in my yard, I put my wild ginger down and they love it. So they don't seem to mind it there. Um, I also have Virginia water leaf that's in that area. I've heard Virginia water leaf can get weedy and kind of get out of control, but around my pine trees, they've just maintained an, their own nice little patch and they haven't really tried to escape at all. So um, they're happy enough that they're healthy around my pine trees without getting out of control. So those two seem to like it there. Um, may apples, I've got may apples that are growing there. Um, what else do I have in there? Oh, um, the geranium. Really a lot of those are, are all happy around my pine trees too. So let's see, we talked about containers. What else we got in here? Okay. I think I have answered 
all of the questions that I see here. What else? Uh, problem with Virginia creeper. Boy, I do too. Um, that's another one, cutting, digging, pulling as much of it as you can. Birds, unfortunately, will spread the seeds. It is native, if that makes you feel any better. Um, and it does, uh, it is a host plant for a butterfly or moth. I forget which one, but I did come across that. Um, so it does have that benefit, if that makes you feel any better, I know. Um, but I, I do have it showing up all over my yard too, and it's really obnoxious. Um, so generally my recommendation for woody things when you're trying to get rid of them, if you're going to use herbicide to help kill the root, if you can't dig them up, um, is you take a paintbrush, like a foam disposable paintbrush, you dip it in the herbicide and you just paint over the top of the cut surface. That helps the plant to translocate it back down into the roots to kill off the roots. Um, but, you know, digging, cutting, pulling as much of it out as you can first, you know, that's, that's always the route we want to try and go first. So best of luck with it. I, I know the frustration, believe me. Um, is geranium maculata a spring ephemeral? Yes, it is, Donna. It is one that comes up early in the spring. It's one of the first ones. It's blooming right now, um, at least here in Chicago. And it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a great spring ephemeral. The, the greenery, I like the fact that it persists throughout the summer. It's not one that, you know, totally dies back after it's done blooming. So uh, yes, that is a spring ephemeral. Um, let's see, if I have ivy, should I get rid of it and leave the Virginia creeper since it's native? Again, I'm gonna defer back to the Marie Kondo on this. Um, Ivy, generally we recommend getting rid of, yes. Virginia creeper, if you like it, if you don't mind it being there, if it's not in a place where it's causing any problems, then by all means, leave it. If, however, it's causing problems and getting into places and looking bad, I mean, mine's trying to crawl across my driveway at the moment, and it, I swear it grows like two inches a day. Um, then, you know, if, if, it's, if it's not sparking joy, get rid of it. So that's, that's kind of my feelings on that as well. All right, if I didn't get to your question, if you have other questions, if you think of other questions later, please feel free to drop me an email. There is my email address right there or any of the emails that you have gotten um, regarding this webinar. So uh, with that, I'm going to wrap up here and Happy gardening, everybody. Happy spring. Hope you all get a chance to get out and enjoy this lovely weather that we're having. Finally, it's starting to warm up again here in Chicago anyway. So um, hopefully it's, it's starting to look nice by you and enjoy everything. We will see you back next week to talk about dragonflies. If you have mosquito problems in your wet backyards, dragonflies are your best friends. So hope to see you back next week to learn some more about dragonflies. Thanks everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Bye.